I've no yeast. I know you, Marjorie. What do you know? I know you've got yeast. My eyes are old, but I see through you. You're a cold woman and getting worse, and you'll die without a friend in this parish when if you gave yeast to your good neighbors, everyone would bless you. I've no yeast. But you don't give, and they say... What a mean, bitter woman and curse yet. There's nobody curses me. Welcome to Radical Listening, the Portland podcast where we talk to local artists about their work. I'm your host, Phil Johnson. And I'm your co-host, Clifton Holtznagel. Today we're talking with the team of Vinegar Tom, a podcast written by Carol Churchill, produced by The Theater Company. Uh, we're talking with Jen Rowe, the director of the show, as well as Diane Conrad, who plays Joan, and Ashley Mellinger, who plays Betty. Um, you can find the podcast on thetheaterco.org. That's theater with an R-E. And you can find the podcast on their website through November 14th. This was, um, this was a great conversation. We talk a lot about Vinegar Tom. We talk about the actor's process, getting into uh, voice acting versus, you know, being in the space and then what, what it's like to rehearse on Zoom. And um, and we just want to thank all the listeners for standing by us um, during this quarantine time. We know that we're not producing as many episodes as we were before, but we are very much looking forward to getting back into it and, and releasing episodes as the productions, you know, whether they're Zoom productions and other types of things happening around Portland start to pop back up. So keep listening with Radical Listening. And now here's the show. Today we're talking with the team of Vinegar Tom, a podcast written by Carol Churchill at The Theater Company. You can find the podcast at thetheaterco.org. That's theater with an R-E. Uh, today we have Jen Rowe, the director, Diane Conrad, and Ashley Mellinger, who are both actors in the show. Jen, how are you doing today? I'm doing just fine. I mean, honestly, it's it's getting towards bedtime for me. Mm. It used to be showtime around this time, and now it's after since quarantine, now it feels like bedtime. I can relate to but that. I'm great. <laughs> Diane, it's lovely to have you on the show. How are you doing this evening? It is lovely. I actually am using uh, the same um, setup that I use for Vinegar Tom, which is computer on ironing board. Yes. So that's the first time. That's the first time for this. That's fancy. That's great. No, I like that. That's great. And Ashley, how are you? I'm doing really well. I have been in Zoom all day. I think I started at 8.45 this morning. (laughs) So it, yeah, it just turned into one of those days. (laughs) Yeah. I live in Zoom now. Oh my God. Well, well, I'm so sorry. (laughs) No, no, no. I, I, I want to be here. This is actually all of the, all of the zooms that I was in were great. Um, I'm, I'm in this conference right now, uh, called facing race with the race forward national convention. And so that has just, you know, taken up a lot of my time today. Yeah. So it's all good stuff. I'm not uh, bummed at all about being here. (laughs) Great. Well, we're glad to have you. Yeah. Thank you so much. So Vinegar Tom, I mean, it's fantastic. I I felt like I didn't know what to expect. And I guess I didn't, you know, I auditioned. So, you know, full disclosure, I had read the script. But Jen, I I didn't know what I was reading, I guess, until and when I heard it, it, the production was just the value was so high. I was like, oh, my God, this sounds like a production. And so thank you so much for for doing that. And I'm just excited to see the future of the theater company in Portland. Thank you. Thank you for all of that. Um, and for auditioning as well. Um, yeah, I did this play, um, 15 years ago. I played Alice in college because this play is often produced in colleges. It's not often produced on the professional circuit. I think for a couple of reasons, one is just because it's, it says cunt twice and it's, not like a a safe play for a lot of audiences. And it's more of a protest piece than like a a play play. Um, And I think that one of the hard things about reading the script is trying to understand emotional life and emotional journey that's happening through it because it's so stark Mm -hmm. and it's so honest and so brutal. And um, I don't think that I knew exactly what play I was in when I was (laughs) Alice 15 years ago. I think that I knew my track, 
but I don't think that I understood all of the songs that were being sung, the the um, the messages that were coming through in the text. I don't think that that was a part of my world in the play. I was, I think that I was just kind of acting alone a lot. And we were living in a, in a different world and I was living, living in a different frame of mind in terms of my perception of the world. And so when um, it's just kind of always sat on my shelf and uh, yeah, so yeah, I, I, I don't think that I knew what play that I was in 15 years ago. And when Trump was elected, I picked it back up uh, because I was thinking a lot about women, a woman's place in society. And, uh, and I reread it and I remember just thinking, oh my God, all of these people are so desperate. And all of these people have been so mistreated by the people who are supposed to be taking care of them. And all of these people found themselves in this mindset of paranoia, which led to the escalation of finding someone they believed to have answers for them who ultimately ended up killing them, you know? And that trajectory is so much more clear to me in terms of a story around what I'm experiencing in my own life when I think about the world, when I think about the moments that have led up to this moment, um, when I think about my own um, financial situation and how I feel about uh, the escalation of things and also the lack of support in, in, um, in terms of the class system and structure that we have in America. And so that was like the angle that really drew me back into the play was more about the, the, the class conversation mm. and feeling awful for all of these people to have been put in a situation where they turned on themselves. Um, mm. And so, so it felt like it, it felt really appropriate to the time. And I, I decided to do it a couple of years ago. I asked Diane to come and do a reading a few years ago um, at my place. And, and then when we started the theater company, it was the, at the top of my list. I was like, I, if we're, if I'm going to direct one show in our first season, I want it to be this one. And I want it to happen during the election. Um, and so, yeah, it just felt like I, I, I think that theater takes up a lot of time and space and energy um, from people. And so I think that when we do it, we should do it with huge intention mm. behind why the thing that we're doing needs to take up so much time and space and energy. And so that just felt like mm. the the thing for me to do. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it definitely felt timely. I When I, what, when I listened to the uh, play, I went back and kind of read a little bit about it and just learned and just learning about um, when it was written, how it was written and what, for what intention it was written. And then thinking about the seventies and thinking about all the cultural movements of the seventies and then thinking about where we are right now. It's just, it's so cyclical and interesting that you produced it. And I honestly think that that was one of the elements that stood out to me in terms of the production, like the music, for instance, seeing how cyclical the music was. I mean, because it, it has to be modern, right? Or it's suggested to be modern. And so the idea that there is a song in there to me that sounded like uh, Hamilton was kind of cool. Uh, oh, but which no, one? I don't know the names, but I just, that's what it sounded like to me. I had no, I had, I, I came up with the idea for all of these songs, but I've never seen Hamilton. And oh so my I'm, God. I'm just so curious. Well, it's like that, uh, it's like that Hamilton rap beat type thing. Yeah, it's like on. musical style okay, okay, okay. but i uh well there was definitely a lot of things that sounded musical style to me and one of them was had like spoken word or rapping moments in it and i was just like think because i did see hamilton this summer i just like, i was like all right i'm gonna sit down and watch hamilton <laughs> it's covid <laughs> i have nothing else to do and so I just thought that was like a cool kind of thing, like reference back or illusion that um, stood out to me. What was the process of putting the music together like? Well, it's so when we first uh, chose the piece, I was really ambitious with it. When we were going to be performing it live, we decided for it to happen at the Hallowed Halls because it's a recording studio and the history of the building is a really incredible one in terms of it being um, Oregon's first government building named after a woman. Oh, where and is that? Wait, oh, what was that? Wait, where is that building? It's on Southeast, like 64th and Foster. Um, it's a beautiful historic building. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And I was like, well, how cool would it be if I hired eight different musicians, local bands to write each of the songs for Vinegar Tom? Because mm -hmm. the intent of the show is, like you said, it's, it's Brechtian. It's supposed to like jar you out of the 17th century and fast forward you into a confrontational now and then put you right back into the 17th century. And so our shows were canceled as a result of COVID, of course, and funding and resources became a real conversation around hiring that many local bands and musicians. And so um, we, I, I, I do play piano and I sing and I was in a band for a long time and stuff. And so I was like, well, I've been away from music for so long. Why don't, it was, and it was getting down to the wire, frankly. And I was like, I have to have something for these songs. So I just sat and I like spoke saying into my phone and um, met with my sound designer, Cameron McPhee. And I was like, hey, do these have anything? Cause it's all that I've got right now. And he <laughs> was like, oh yeah, this can work. Yeah, we can maybe do this, this and this. And, and you know, gave me some compliments and I was like, all right. And so <laughs> we left and then, uh, and then I, you know, taught the cast over Zoom, which is not easy because <laughs> I was no one can about sing that. together over Zoom. No. And so we ended up having everyone turn off their microphones and sing to a track that I shared screen with, um, which was me singing, which was is one of the most humiliating things I've ever put forth oh in gosh. a rehearsal room. And uh <laughs> Yeah. And so, so then what was super cool after that, that happened, aside from the fact that the cast like embraced all of those songs and like made them into something really amazing was that when, uh, when I was talking to Justin at the hallowed halls about my original plan, um, I was going to ask him about his connections that he has because he's owned the place for 30 years and he's recorded a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of bands. And, uh, he was like, oh, well, I have this musician named Lynx who's in the recording studio doing her own stuff the day before you come in. Do you want me to ask and see if she wants to like throw some stuff down on your songs? Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, that would be amazing. And he did, she said, yes. And Lynx is a multi-instrumentalist beatbox, like beatboxer, she's like toured the nation um, on the electronic circuit. And uh, yeah, she came in and just like played around with the stuff that, <laughs> Basically, we just, I just had the actors like say stuff or sing stuff to no music at all. And then we, we like, we manipulated and morphed a bunch of stuff in order to create something um, that coalesced together with links. And uh, it all, like, she just, she elevated everything. Wow to the extreme. And then I also have to say that Cameron McPhee uh, put together two of the songs as well, um, the backing tracks to two of the songs, which I also really, really yeah. adore. I always really so like yeah, his work. The, yeah, yeah, Cameron's yeah, always great and cranks it out, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I curious for Diane or Ashley, uh, what, what's the process like um, as an actor for recording an audio play? It's obviously very different and that's probably a general question, but I mean, um, what was the rehearsal process like for you? And then how, how did it end up going down? Sure. I mean, the biggest thing that was different about it was the lack of being able to be in the same room with people. I think that theater is, um, is something that uh, is really grounded in this world of like physical proximity to each other. We work a lot um in space and and sort of determining how we move through space and how we respond to each other in real time and so that was something that was lost when we kind of entered this very two-dimensional world of zoom that being said one of the great things about rehearsing for a podcast and doing everything online and just using uh, vocals is that i could show up to rehearsal not showered, no makeup, basically five minutes after I woke up if I wanted to. Right. And and it's just so luxurious. You don't have to get up off your right. chair. You no one knows what's on the snacks. bottom half. What's that? Because no one knows what's on your bottom half. It could be pajama pants and, and slippers. Or nothing at all. Or nothing, or nothing, nothing at, all. at all. No one knows. You know? Luxury. So, yeah, nobody knows. Unless you tell them, which you won't. So, uh, yeah. So I think that that's those were the big things that jumped out to me. Um, 
for me, I do a lot of work outside of rehearsal and I try to do as much of that as I usually do for a show, but I consistently felt the, um, the constraint of not having top to toe human instrument to become a character. And actually the voice I ended up using for Joan, I think I told Jen, I never would have been able to carry on with that vocal quality during an entire live production. Wow, that's that was interesting. Just too, um, it was too taxing hmm. uh, on my vocal cords, but it worked fine, especially because I had nothing else, right? I didn't have yeah. my spine. I didn't have my knees. I didn't have my toes. I didn't have any of that to make the audience see her. Hmm. So that was a concern of mine. And then, boy, I almost was just grabbing through the screen to try to be with people. And it took a while hmm. to just surrender to the fact that all I was going to get was, was the sound of who they were. Mm -hmm. um, and we did have both kinds of rehearsals. We had rehearsals that are like we are now, where we can see each other while we're talking. Mm -hmm. And then we had rehearsals where we we turned off our cameras mm -hmm. and we only listened to each other. And that really was the thing that, that forced me, mm -hmm. <laughs> not allowed me, but forced me to say, okay, this is who we are. Because even I have a long history as a, a voice talent. And, you know, once upon a time when you did that kind of work, you were across the table from people. <laughs> Yeah. And now, uh, very often, you don't even get to hear the other person who's in the the audio with you. So it was pretty luxurious, as it turned out, that you could actually hear the other actors and that everybody was trying to be as together as they could. And then, of course, to actually have a good director mm -hmm. to help was uh, a wonderful thing. But absolutely, it was... Um, I like the theater. <laughs> <laughs> I like the theater. I like people in a room. We'll see when that happens again. Yeah, it's yeah. so it's so interesting how the I mean, we all talk about how theater's this live thing and it totally is and you realize it it really just has to be live in every <laughs> aspect cuz like yeah, okay, we can do a play that people can listen to, but still we have to have this barrier between the actors that's there and it's just like I, it, it's just it, it really just shows what a live like what it means to have live um, connection with people. Um, but it's also yeah. led to some really cool stuff. I have to say, like, um, it's interesting because for the Moors, we were in rehearsals together and then got together over Zoom to do the Moors and then went into Hallowed Halls to record the Moors live. And that experience felt very easy because we already had known what blocking was between mm -hmm. us. We mm -hmm. had already had a lot of conversations in person. And for Vinegar Tom, I was always really, really curious about what was going to happen step by step because I knew that a lot of these people in the cast hadn't worked together, hadn't known each other. And there are those little connections too, where it's like just packing up your stuff or like making eye contact yeah. across the table and like rolling your eyes at someone <laughs> about table work or something. Like all these little connective moments are lost, you know? And so that's why it was so incredibly important to Brandon and I to do the whole shebang and get like COVID tested for the whole cast uh, multiple times and make sure that we could all be together in person so that we could see each other um, to make sure that that we felt at least some sort of physical connection when recording the show. Cause like there's, yeah, it's, it's so important. Like you were saying, it, right. there has to be a live thread to it. So you were able, when you recorded it, were you finally, were you all in the same room for this one? Yeah. For the Moors and for, um, and for Vinegar Tom, for both of our podcasts, we, um, so we had that previous partnership with the Hallowed Halls, which is the recording studio. And we just asked them if they would produce our podcast basically with oh, us. And so um, we had everyone COVID tested um, for both the Moors and for Vinegar Tom, and we went through SAG, the union, and we got our contracts um, approved through them to have people live yeah. in the room together creating this work. Oh, great. That's awesome. That's cool. Did you yeah. have to do anything different in terms of like preparation for a role like this? I mean, because there's no physicality, 
were you practicing with your voice differently than usual or were you listening to yourself or how, how, how was that process for you guys? I absolutely listened to the, re I listened real hard to, during rehearsal of other people's scenes. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I could, especially with Jack and Marjorie, who uh, my character spends a lot of time uh, talking with and in conflict with. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was almost like I used a different part of my brain to try huh. and understand who these people were because not only do we only see the slice of them that's in the scene, but I only get a slice of them through my head, right? Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I literally don't get to feel the energy off of the visceral energy off of another human being um, that gives me a whole lot of information that informs my subconscious interpretation of a role. Yeah. So all of that is like, poof, that's all gone. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and what I had left, it's almost like, you know, when people say, if you're blind, your sense of smell really enlarges. It was that kind of thing of trying to use uh, my auditory senses extra hard mm -hmm. to make a human mm -hmm. out of the people I was talking with. And as far as, uh, you know, toying with my own voice, that was a lot of, um, throwing something out and asking Jen, is, is this what you want? Does this sound like her, right? Which is really mm -hmm. uh, a lot of what a regular rehearsal is. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. You come and bring something and the director says yes, or they say no. Um, so that was the same, but yeah, I was really trying to feel the world of the play as presented just auditorially yeah did it end up uh, invoking any physicality in either of you were you using physicality to influence the voice both of us are nodding yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. you want to talk about it ashley well first i want to say that diane Condrat is amazing well, and yeah. <laughs> nailed her character it's and so it's just so clear from listening alone all of the work that she did um but i can attest that she indeed inhabited a physicality when she took on this <laughs> character um, in, in the recording process. And, and I do think that I found it very helpful. Uh, you know, I think the character that I play kind of walks on their tiptoes a little bit. And so I was shifting my weight forward a lot when I was in the, and these are things that just happen naturally as an actor in sure. as a theater actor and um so i didn't think that there would be a whole lot of use throwing that out <laughs> just because no one's going to see me doing it yeah. um so i i found that to be very helpful in inhabiting the character i think anytime you build a character working with their phys physicality is useful and the voice is an extension of your physicality too mm -hmm. so i i didn't feel that that was um to be ignored in this process either. And I found it to actually really enhance it personally. Thank yeah, you. well, we were in the studio. I, I kind of, when, when I was at home, you know, there's nobody here to see me completely scrunched over to do this voice because I wanted her, I mean, she's old and I wanted her to sound as if she had suffered in the past and was currently suffering, right? Something had to hurt her. L nothing about her life is easy mm -hmm. at this time. And it wasn't really until we got into the studio and I started working when I was like, oh no, I can't have the microphone at that level because I'm gonna be crunched over and it has to come all the way down here. And then when we did the final scene, me and Hulana, it was like, oh yes, I get to stand up. I get to stand up, I get to raise that mic. I get to be really mm -hmm. physically free because in order to do Joan, my body helped me. And then I didn't have to be thinking I'm uncomfortable. I really was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was so much in this play about pain. And I, I had a note about, I, I don't know if it was a line or something, but this idea of paying with pain throughout the whole show. Um, and it's all in and, and like going along with this like inherent original sin. Um, it, it seemed to be a strong theme. So how, how do you see that playing out? Um, Cause this is very topical towards today and it was written in the seventies and 
people were really realizing that, I mean, a lot of the pain that women go through and have to deal with and seeing it as like, um, um, like a punishment. Yeah. So, uh, I, I'm just curious, uh, how much that influenced the show for you, Jen, or anybody? Um, you know, the idea, the idea of a woman's pain being sent to us by God is the, is the big thing. And, um, I think topically, um, the pivot of the evangelical church over the last, um, couple of decades has resulted in, um, in a terrifying mentality. And, um, and so I think like, that's, that's where I relate that idea. Like that's where, where that thread goes for me. I, I want to let the other two respond to this, but I, I also want to say that right before this, I was watching a Scientology documentary, the one that Leah Remney oh, is doing. Yeah. Episodes yeah, Breaking on, Dark. And I wrote put this quote down from L. Ron Hubbard, where he says, um, religion is always different than truth. The only way you can control anybody is to lie to them. As I use the word religion, it has nothing to do with God. And I just thought that that was, that encapsulated so much truth to this story, to how God is represented and used and mm. manipulated in this story alongside with original sin. And yeah, so I'll let the other two respond. Well, if I start talking about pain, I'll never stop. Um, I just, you know, as the Buddhists say, life is suffering. And the thing about uh, taking a script from the 1970s when um, I was alive and none of you were, right? Um, <laughs> is there's another play that I produced uh, where I used to live uh, by Dario Fo and Franco Rame. Dario Fo um, was once uh, named poet laureate of Italy and everybody was mad because he's a clown. Uh, but their show, Orgasmo Adulto Escapes from the Zoo, let me tell you, it's a great hook for an audience pull, uh, was first brought to America by Estelle Parsons, who toured it, it's 12 monologues, and she arranged to have it um, translated into English. And uh, it's, it's almost Shakespearean in its challenge. You either are really good in this show or you really suck in this show. So it's really um, an exciting script. But the truth is you take this show that was written in the late 1960s and, and 1970s and almost nothing is different mm. for women. I mean, there's a few things, but the basic, I mean, the if everybody worked as hard as me in uh, Vinegar Tom that Jessica Tidd uh, led us in, it's so much that, I mean, look at the Supreme Court. I'm so yeah. sad to say, yeah. look at the Supreme Court with a, a person, a, a woman who's like, I listen to my husband every day. And if he tells me to stick my finger in my eye, I think that's the right thing to do. It's a nightmare yeah. to, and it's a nightmare for women. And then there's the nightmare for people of color in this country. I mean, how far back can we go before there is no nightmare in America? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I don't um, know the answer to that question, but then it turns into internalized oppression. And mm -hmm. Goody is a great um, example of that in Vinegar Tom. It's like, yeah, I'm going to go over and vote for Donald Trump because I'm a woman and he's a big, strong man. What kind of madness, right? Mm -hmm. But the same kind of madness is happens for Susan in Vinegar Tom. It's like, oh, I didn't know I was a witch. Shit. Right. I better say my prayers or I'm going to burn forever. Yeah. Why don't you just hang me instead? It's like, wow, to see it all turn around like that is uh, terrifying and very contemporary. Well, and there's something about that kind of cult mindset. You know, you brought up Scientology, but, you know, we've been calling the Trump presidency a cult for four years now. And you can tell that these people are their minds are hijacked they're in a information bubble and um it's wild i mean it's 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 a crazy phenomenon actually i feel like let's just take our break now and we'll come back and we'll do headlines we'll do some plugs and we'll wrap it up radical listening is a production of virtual sonic reality and coho productions visit coho online at cohoproductions.org for more great content welcome back Welcome it, back. It's time for headlines. Headlines, headlines, this headlines. This is um, this is the best part of the show. It's <laughs> commonly referred. Yeah, that all of our fans say that this is their favorite. Yeah. And so this <laughs> is we're gonna read headlines to you and get your take. Um, 
So yeah, so this, just play this along. There's pressure. no pressure. No yeah. pressure. <laughs> okay. This one is fun. Joe Biden is the projected winner of the 2020 presidential election. Applause. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Good God! Yay! Yes. That's that's that headline. We just had to we just had to have an official moment where we got to announce that and be happy about that on the show. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, how are you guys feeling? I mean, it's been a long year, a long motherfucking year. Let me tell you. <laughs> it's been a long four years. It's true. I was lucky. Um, I have an astrologist that I've worked with for years, and she told me they weren't we weren't going to know right away. So I was like, mm. never mind. Mm-hmm. Gail Fairfield says we're not going to know right away. So it's <laughs> okay, but she's pretty sure it's Biden. So I was like, oh, phew. When she did his um, the charts, she did everybody's charts, and she said that that Joe Biden's. She said this chart could belong to a monk. Whoa. Wow. He's so oh, really, he's really so compassionate and uh, empathetic. Yeah, it was an interesting thing. Well, you know, nothing against Gemini's, but you guys have a lot. You got to. <laughs> I'm ashamed. You've... I'm a Gemini. You're and, a Gemini. You know, oh, I'm so sorry. I can't even say how much I hate him for being one of. <laughs> That's funny. How about you, Ashley? Have you been My mother's a Gemini. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Does it track? My mother's a Gemini. So shout out to mom. <laughs> you know what's up so do you okay so do you under diane do you feel like you understand trump because you're a gemini like it, what's going on um i'm not only a gemini but i have like seven planets in gemini so as my astrologer said you should i have virgo rising which makes me bitchy and bossy um <laughs> and she said you should thank god every day that you have virgo rising or you wouldn't be able to blow your nose oh my so God. i'm i'm just way scattered but you know a lot of people consider gemini's uh as really good communicators and clearly he's managed to uh arrange marketing and manipulation of people yeah um in a way that has led an entire country into the shithole so yippee i mean he's good at it it worked (laughs) oh my gosh that's funny well, yeah, I'll just say for one, I'm so excited to be finally leaving this Trump show. I mean, four seasons is more than enough. Yeah, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I did not know that. I did not expect. I didn't know what to expect. Uh, I expected the worst for a while, mainly because QAnon came at, came into my world right. a few months ago, and I was like, "We're oh, it's over." Oh, yeah. It's like, what the hell? It's over. But I, yeah, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled for Biden. I. I, I've always thought that he, because he's experienced such loss in his life, it might be a really nice time to have someone who understands that right now. Yeah. Um, and I also think that he's the, he's someone who's like at baseline is going to put people back to work in positions and roles that we need desperately to fill back up and get a connection back with the World Health Organization and pump up the right. CDC. Like I just, I, that's, that's what I'm most excited about right now um and then i'm also excited to keep pushing him and kamala's agenda around the next four years yeah. assuming that trump will actually you know leave that place yeah well yeah. gail fairfield well, says yes he will okay thank god <laughs> <laughs> thank you gail it'll take a while it'll take like uh, sometime uh, uh early to mid-december right but they said they're gonna drag mom. him out kicking and screaming yeah <laughs> happy to see it um okay so Maybe this this is this is a tweet from uh, someone named Creme Brulee, uh, who is a, a an organizer and comedian and rapper, and has been very very heavily involved with the liberation movement this summer. And they tweeted, "IDK, who needs to hear this? But if you're blaming the fact that Ted Wheeler got 150 thousand votes on a black woman, then you're really missing the entire point." And that's in reference to. Um, of course, the Teresa Rayford write-in campaign that took 12% or so of the um, of the popular vote, which some people say was the reason that Sarah Ayanarone did not win. Um, but this person's take is that, you know, maybe it was uh, the people who voted for Wheeler whose fault it was that Wheeler got elected. Was anyone to have a dog in the race in like the in the mayoral election for any reasons? Uh, I mean, I supported the Teresa Rayford write-in campaign. And I think it's preposterous that anybody would try to blame Ted Wheeler's mayorship on on Teresa Rayford. I mean, that kind of 
denies the whole workings of our democracy, which is anybody can run for office and uh, it is not that person's fault if somebody else wins that office. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. yeah that is uh, to me just extremely misplaced yeah. blame. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think it's absolutely amazing that Ted Wheeler has survived and um, and I'm shocked about learning that our city is retaining him as a mayor after all that's happened this summer. I've honestly, I've, when I looked at the electoral map after the presidency, I was like, okay, one way to look at it is like racism, you know, like there's, there's a Appalachian mountain of racism in the middle of our country, you know, but there's also wealth is something that we don't talk about enough, enough in America. One, one idea that popped into my head was, oh, that's just like all of the like, middle class and upper class people they just moved into the middle of the country which they were i mean obviously they were going to do anyway and they're just kind of holding their space in that area and it it may i mean maybe they were motivated by racism but also they could have possibly just been motivated by taxes and um you know all kinds of different things and so it's interesting to think about how money protects certain systems and with the Teresa rayford thing that's what comes up for me is yeah there's there's a movement that we want to push more to the left but also you can see in portland there are people who are on the left who are very who still have moneyed interests and that was then ted was definitely their pick like yeah there was just no way you were going to convince those people to vote for somebody who was a communist ex-communist or somebody who was just a straight-up progressive yeah it reminds me of uh, the song in vinegar tom find something to burn Mm. Um, you know, you have to blame somebody, so let's blame her. Yeah. All right. I got last headline. One more headline. Okay. This is um I just saw this today. I don't know if you guys saw this. AOC lashes out at Democratic Party over lack of support. I didn't even know if I would run for re-election, is what she said. So <laughs> there's like some murmurs that AOC may be dropping out of politics or may want to drop out of politics because she doesn't feel supported by the DNC. She's not supported by the DNC. Well, that's definitely true. I mean, and 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 what I like what I understand is that she was a huge proponent of the and is of the Green New Deal and uh because of a certain lack of imagination and um fear of progression, uh the Biden campaign had to basically adopt like a certain percentage of what that Green New Deal was and, and like repurpose it and market it and brand it as the Biden plan to make people feel a little bit safe about making incremental change rather than making the actual leaps of change that are necessary for us to continue inhabitable life on this planet together. Um, And so, so it's, yes, it's, it's very infuriating to me. I'm muting my. No, it's you. No, totally. You don't have to mute yourself. Oh, she's screaming. <laughs> she's screaming. We are now looking at Jenro <laughs> screaming into a muted Zoom. <laughs> Welcome to 2020. <laughs> screaming into a muted Zoom. No, but yeah, I mean, yeah. I, 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 I hope that she stays. I think that she's needed. Right. And it's hard, but I hope that she stays. I think about that often. I was I was talking to a 12-year-old the other day about how daunting it is that in this country, if you don't have a bunch of money, mm-hmm. you don't get to be in politics. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean about who's in politics? Right. A bunch of wildly controlling uh, wealthy people. Uh, the chance for somebody who's actually got concern for others to rise in the political environment that we have is it's like everything's against everything's against them so yeah it's no surprise that she doesn't feel supported yeah because i'm sure she's not because she doesn't have enough money to pay people off <laughs> I, I guess right and you but know i hope uh, she i hope she stays around because i think she's supposed to be the vp when kamala is the president I right would hope isn't so. that how it's supposed to work <laughs> that would be cool unless huh? she runs as like a green party candidate or something crazy mm-hmm. yeah i think that maybe that's the the way in to start opening up this get out of this two party system. And if we could get someone like AOC on like a progressive ticket or something like that, then maybe we can start opening up this, making things a little more interesting. Cause I mean, you, I mean, in a lot of those, you know, house and Senate races, you were seeing some places kind of getting three way splits and 
Um, it's starting to open up I mean, a bit. People are sick yeah. of it, you know? We could go into, I mean, my buddy Joe Gibson and I were talking the other day and we were like, we see a four party system. If we're going to start breaking off, there's, yeah. I mean, there's oh, a yeah. good chance of a four party, party system too within each, you know, blue right. and red. Uh, that's pretty clear. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what you call uh, Georgia is a great example. So the Senate races, the runoffs in Georgia, one of those races is run against the richest senator in America. So have fun with that. I mean, definitely point your your sights to Georgia in terms of reaching out to anyone you know and telling them to vote for the Democratic senators so we can actually do anything. Because could you imagine another Obama term with a Mitch McConnell or whatever? Oh, my God. It'd be a waste of time. I, and like trying to put a lot of I think a lot of us are trying to put a lot of hope and uh, into the fact that Biden was someone who traditionally was able to reach across the aisle, especially with people like Mitch McConnell in the past. But it just it's not it's not that's not enough. And right. that's not what needs to happen right now. We shouldn't have to rely on on him working magic with someone who should not be in a position of authority. And Mitch has said over and over again that he, I mean, he didn't even want to approve Biden's cabinet or whatever. Like he's, he's saying he doesn't want to do anything. So, I mean, this guy, he's, he's really saying. like an evil henchman. Like he, he's the worst. <laughs> evil turtle. Yeah. And his hands. Have you seen his hand? I mean, his yes. hands are, is that, is that real? Is that shit real? Have you been watching um, Love, Lovecraft Country? No. Uh, but has his anyone? hands are black. Are they, cool. are, are, are they no, covered in blood? What's with his yeah. hands? They're changing they are, colors. They're, they're blue they're like bruised all over yeah. as if he's got like diabetes hands and he just like stands with his hands hanging out of his jacket all the time showing all of us his creepy hands it's true that's satan right there see that's the first that's the first thing in the show show me your feet <laughs> take off your shoes you're satan wow he's just yeah. showing us satan hands yeah it's a horcrux <laughs> people are thinking it's a horcrux hidden in his hand i mean <laughs> that, he's so old he's got to be sick i mean there should be a retirement age for politicians he's right? so bad he's got to be sick yeah, he's like true. it's time yeah. goodbye goodbye sir <laughs> yeah oh. Oh my he's God. so sick he should be gone right mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah definitely <laughs> well you know everybody point towards you know your stars tonight and make a wish we've got three more months or whatever before we actually take over this thing yeah we'll see yeah plenty of time yeah <laughs> well okay so let's do plugs because we're here let's while we're while we're waiting for the end of the trump you know dynasty let's what what can we watch? What can we what can we read? What do we need to be I've got paying attention for you. to? Yeah, I'll let you all think about it, and I'll I'll rattle mine off here. Um, so um, and this whole year uh, has been really just a great um ode to the audiobook for me. Um, got the Multnomah County Library Libby app. Um, <laughs> been listening to so many audiobooks. Shout out. Shout out to the Multnomah County Library. I probably said that before on this show but um right now i'm reading parable of the sower by octavia e butler very good i've been listening to a lot of octavia butler lately and this one is blowing my mind um i uh, i started listening to the next one parable of the talents on accident because i didn't realize it was like the second one and then had to stop i was like really upset because i had to stop and then like wait eight weeks to get this but it was worth it and um but basically it takes place in 2024 and there's a president running on a make america great slogan who's running against a sleepy vice president ex-vice president and it was written in like 93 so uh i don't know everyone should read this book it, it's basically in it, in this world by 2024 it's like walled out walled off neighborhoods and like you know neighborhoods are trying to like help each other survive but then there's a lot of people who don't live in a neighborhood and they're all like really really poor and destitute and then oh uh, man and the the lead character is this like hyper empath who can like actually feel other people's pain by looking at them if they go through pain and so it's just oh it's really good i uh highly recommend it and it's it's scarily like Impression. Oh yeah, and the the guy who's running the 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 guy who's running for president on Make America America Great. His name is Donner. Yeah. So I don't know. Highly recommend Parable right. of the Sower by Octavia Butler. And I'm looking. For, I'm I'm so glad there's a sequel. I think it might be a three parter. Um, I'm not sure, but 
Parable of the Sower. It's on audiobook. Whoa. Listen to it. It's that easy. <laughs> yeah, right. tell us what's coming. <laughs> yeah, I oh know, my right? <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, I'll plug real quick. Uh, we Are Who We Are. It's on HBO Max. It's a show. I started watching it, I think, last week or a few days ago, and it's been incredible. It's about a 14-year-old queer boy who is uprooted from his life, and he is now living with his mother in Italy, and she is like a commander in an army, and he's just like living on a base, and he meets another friend. It's like a coming-of-age story. It's really beautiful, and it's also really interesting and artfully and tastefully done. So shout out to We Are Who We Are on HBO Max. Um, yeah, I'll plug uh, a documentary that I learned about recently called First Vote, directed by Yi Chen. And it is all about Asian American voters in battleground states. Really interesting thing about Asian American voters is that they represent a diverse group of people. They have a very diverse um, uh, set of political alignments. Uh, and and so this documentary just kind of investigates voters and uh, Asian American immigrants and Asian American citizens who voted for Trump, who were pro-Trump, who supported him, why they did that, um, and sort of the differences between different Asian communities in how they identify politically. So it's really eye-opening and was very educational and uh, just an interesting documentary. I think that documentaries are wonderful and have the power to affect change and to educate folks. And this is no exception. First vote. Uh, I'll, I'll go. Um, so I will recommend the 40 year old version, uh, V-E-R-S-I-O-N, the 40 year old version. Uh, this is Rada Blank's uh, film and uh, it's, really great for especially the Portland theater community, I think, to watch um, and learn about what it means to see. Yeah, it's excellent. It's um, what it means for a Black female playwright to um, write for white theater, basically, mm. and uh, and deal with and navigate that minefield. And uh, on top of that, and uh, equally as important, it's about what it means for a woman to turn 40 and be single and be an artist and uh, be questioning her life choices and also be um, handling life with more conviction than ever. And it's really, really wonderfully done. It's hilarious, it's beautiful, and it's really, really smart. I'm just going to plug uh, walking outside in appropriate rain gear. Uh, everybody's <laughs> you know, pretty upset about that it's winter coming and we're all screwed because of COVID. And it's like, put on whatever you need to put on and go outside and <laughs> lean against a tree. And uh, maybe next year we won't be in this situation because I read a lot of books, but then I forget them and I get to read them again. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I think. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking with us about Vinegar Tom and everything else. Um, it was a pleasure to have all three of you. Um, it's so exciting. I can't wait to, to be in person with all three of you again. And um, hopefully we'll get to do another podcast in person as well. So thank you. That would so be awesome. Much for, thank you so much for having us. Yes, bye, thank awesome. you. Thank you. Have a good evening. As always, you can find the full catalog of the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and SoundCloud. If you have questions or would like to reach out, feel free to reach out to our email, which is radicallisteningpodcast at gmail.com, or visit the co-host.